Worship is a response, you guys. In Romans 12, one through two, it says, I urge you brothers in view of God's mercy to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. He didn't say offer your best songs and your best guitar riffs, although those are awesome too. <laughs> but just offer your hearts, offer your bodies as a living sacrifice. This is your spiritual act of true worship. Then listen to this. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you'll be able to test and approve what the will of God is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. This is so amazing. We come into worship. We offer ourselves as these living sacrifices of worship to God. And then what happens? Our minds transform and are renewed to think like him. And then we get heavenly perspective and we can discern his good, pleasing, perfect will. We can actually discern in this circumstance that we're fighting with, what's your will, God? What's your goodness in this moment for me? That's just, it's so beautiful. It's really important that we learn how to respond with our bodies. And you guys hear me say this a lot from the front. And I just want to say, I wasn't always like this, <laughs> almost face planting on the stage every, every time I worship. Um, but there is a response in our DNA that's actually, we are created to physically respond to God. In the Psalms, there's like dozens of words for worship that actually are physical action. And some of them are like bowing and kneeling, lifting hands, clapping, standing, lifting up eyes, dancing. Um, whirling around or spinning like a top is literally one of the meanings. Shouting with full volume and many, many more. But worship actually requires a physical response. And sometimes in this room, like we don't feel the permission to do that. But I would say whatever you do in private overflows in public. And it's really the private life with God. I mean, I would love this room to feel so free that we can just express however we want. I know that personalities are different. And we all connect with the Lord differently. But I would just say, in your personal time with the Lord, like, you should just try dancing. I mean, for real. <laughs> like, if you've never been alone and just let it fly, it's an amazing indicator, too, of what we're aware of, what we're conscious of. Because sometimes we can feel embarrassment and we're, like, alone by ourselves. Who are we? Why are we embarrassed? <laughs> I remember the first time, like, Jesus invited me to a dance by myself in my room, and I was like, <laughs> it was awkward, and, but I was like, it's just me. Why am I embarrassed of myself? <laughs> but I will just say, there are realms of freedom and glory. You don't even know what's happening in the spirit realm when you move, when you praise and we don't have time to get into all of that, but it is powerful to use your body. David danced undressed before Jesus. He was so overcome with the love and glory and beauty of God that he just started dancing like a wild man, basically naked. And he said, I'll become even more indignified than this because when you catch a glimpse of God's worthiness, you guys, it doesn't really matter what you look like. You're not thinking about you. You're caught up in him. He encompasses our pain, our problems in those moments, and we're totally taken into this place of just adoring him. And that's actually the place where we have powerful impact in other people. And we're not trying to do it. We're just adoring and loving him. And what flows out is this influence of his spirit. It's like Mary, when she came and she poured oil on Jesus. We know this story. We love it. And she risked ridicule and exposure for her time as a woman to come and lay this gorgeous gift of years of wages, a year's worth of wages, I think it was, of perfume on Jesus. And then she was weeping because she felt so thankful for what God had done for her, for this man, Jesus. And she weeps on him and she dries his feet with her hair. It's this beautiful expression of like, I have to love you. I have to tell you how much I love you. There is a love that casts out fear like that. And I just wanna to say to you guys, insecurity is the greatest 
Insecurity robs true worship. It just totally poisons intimacy. Insecurity poisons intimacy in relationships too. In your marriages, in your relationships, in parent-child relationships, insecurity will erode because the basis of insecurity is fear, right? Perfect love casts out fear. So the antidote isn't we need to work harder, pray more, and like beat ourselves into submission. No, the antidote is we need to just adore God and love him and let his love overcome us so that we're just like, what else can I do but respond to you? I love this uh, TED Talk that I watched uh, like 10 years ago, and it's this powerful study that they did of humans when they step into victory. So Olympics, Olympians, sports, they studied groups all in different people groups, different languages, body language. What is the way that people show a sign of victory in their body? What's their, their body language? And universally, you guys, when someone felt victory, this was their expression. (laughs) Universal. Hands in the air, chin up, face up, huge smile. I can, there's another place that I've seen that posture. (laughs) Right? It's like when we're beholding the glory of God, all we can do is just fully open And it's this place that actually, when we love God, victory courses through our body. It's so important to use your body, guys. And you know what's cool in that study? They even, they even pulled people who had been blind from birth, who had never seen another person ever, had never seen a person respond in victory. So they didn't learn it from somewhere, right? Even people who were blind from birth, when they experienced a great victory, Same expression. We were designed to worship you guys. Worship is the place where we magnify the Lord. Sometimes our times of worship might be a little dull, and I would just say that they're not dull because of Jesus. I would actually wonder if they are dull or they're heavy or they're somber all the time. There's a a soberness that comes with the spirit of God and reverence and beauty and conviction and healing, but there's a somberness that's heavy that can take away, right? And if your worship times are always that way, I would wonder if you're actually seeing the real Jesus or are you seeing like a wax mannequin of him built by religion or by past experiences or what people have told you he's like. And I just feel like today there's this invitation just to see Jesus again, just to see him again. In the Bible, it talks about the angels and the elders and they're around the throne of God and they see Jesus, they see him and they can't help every time they see him throwing down their crowns and saying, holy, holy, holy is the Lord And then somehow the crowns get back on their head and then they see another side of Jesus because he's like a diamond. He's got all these thousands of facets. They see another part of him they never saw before and they throw their crowns down and the angels are singing, Jesus, you're so holy, you're so worthy. And I think for us, when worship gets old, it's like we just need to see a new side of him. We just need to ask him to show us more of him. My friend Crystal, she talks about magnifying the Lord. And she gave me permission to share this, but she would carry around this big magnifying glass and she'd sometimes teach. And she'd say, whatever you magnify gets bigger. So when you magnify the Lord, that's what you see. When you magnify your circumstances or your pain, that's what you see, right? We have this powerful gift, guys, of the eyes of our spirit. 